Roll call. Bauman. He's excused. Berg. Here. Bonet. Here. Serta. Here. Graf. He's excused. Manny. Here. Montemayor. Here. Perez. P Peterson. Didn't come. Rindfleisch. He's a, he's excused. Sigali. Here. Stefan. Van Akron. Vanderwill. Here. Wangerman. Here. Warner. Here. Three, five, seven, nine present. Nine present. Okay, I need someone to move to approve the minutes of July 6th, 2004. Second. Motion made and seconded to approve the minutes of July 6th. Any additions or? Chairman, I think we have to have 11 to have a quorum. I thought you said nine. Sue? I think we need 11 for committee of the whole quorum. Not 100% sure, I'm like 95% or more. Yeah. Two-thirds, three-fourths, or majority? We are, we're a majority of those problems. We are a majority, but that's all we are. Yeah, and I think we have to be two-thirds. There you go. Okay. Double check with Sue, but I think it is. I'm pretty sure. Because we had that one meeting where we had to wait until 11. Yeah. We had three weeks' notice. At least four weeks' notice.
Mike uh, checked with the attorney and he said nine is sufficient for here. So our, okay, we had a motion to, and a second to accept the minutes of July 6th. Now, are there any additions or deletions? If not, all in favor? Aye. Contrary, carried. Okay, tonight's presentation is from the Building Inspection Department and our presenter tonight will be Matt Livingston. So if Matt would come up, he has two other individuals he would like to introduce also then. And then after the uh, presentation, if there's any questions you'd like to uh, ask, just uh, press your buttons and we'll, we'll get through tonight. Thank you. Go ahead, Matt. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce our supervisor, Pete Fullerton. He's got a couple things he'd like to address. Thanks, Matt. Uh, first of all, thank you, Common Council, for letting us uh, be here tonight to talk about building inspection, where we are today, and some of the problems that uh, we're facing. Um, unfortunately, for a year and a half, we were without a housing inspector, and I guess tonight we'd like to introduce um, Dean Hessling. Dean, if you'd like to stand. Dean has been with us since June, I believe, 15th of this year. Um, he's got a lot of work ahead of him. Um, doing a great job and we're happy to have Dean on board. Um, he'll be handing out his cards later so if anybody has any questions you can call Dean regarding housing issues. Um, I'd also like to thank Matt, Matt Livingston. Probably a lot of you know him as the sealer of waste and measures. He also does um, housing inspection, does some part-time block rent um, inspections for us. He's the resident expert in the building inspection department regarding computers. He's kind of a do-it-all kind of guy and We'd like to thank Matt for the PowerPoint presentation for tonight, and I'd like to turn it over to Matt, and uh, it's about a 20, 25 minute presentation, and after that, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Matt. Okay, we'll get started. Uh, Dean's gonna be passing out some uh, information that we're gonna get to uh, as we go through the uh, program here. Um, first of all, a uh, special thank you to Marie Ellis, uh, the city assessor, uh, for providing us the uh, information we needed uh, statistically to uh, do some of the charts we did here, and uh, hopefully we'll learn something from that. And also Henry Miller from the engineering department for putting together the, uh, the plots you see in front of you here. Um, he took some scribblings that we put on some paper and uh, made it look presentable, so we thank him for that. Um, billing inspection was the historic designation of that department, and it was basically an essence of the duties. Um, we had a plumber, a heating inspector, carpenter contractor, an electrician, and a secretary, and that's basically what they did. Um, today, personnel-wise, it hasn't changed much. Um, we do have a plumbing inspector, a clear water inspector, a north side building inspector, south side building inspector, an electrical inspector, and then the housing inspector and weights and measures inspector came over from the city health department uh, when we had uh, the city health department and also a permit clerk. The duties and responsibilities are no longer as indicated. Um, personnel hasn't changed again, but the, uh, the duties and responsibilities have. Um, each one of these people now does licensing, appeals, plan approval, zoning enforcement, they issue citations, enforce the Pet Fancies Ordinance, and numerous other collateral duties. Um, fortunately, with cross-training, they're able to back each other up. Um, what that allows us to do is uh, provide a 47 and a half hour work week, um, 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m., five days a week with no overtime and no outside contracts. The housing inspector that we're gonna talk about tonight um, is formerly of the health department and came over to inspection when that was closed down and went to the county. Um, he was primarily responsible for neighborhood preservation and to inspect rental housing. Today, we did a little bit of research and uh, you're welcome to look at these. Uh, we've got several documents here, just, uh, just a quick internet search. We looked at uh, Fountain, Colorado, Broward, Florida, Costa Mesa, California, Lancaster, California, and Granbury, Texas. And all of these are advertising for code enforcement officers. 
And if you read all these, the uh, position summaries, it's exactly what Dean's doing. <laughs> it's exactly what we've been doing for years. Um, so remember that name, Code Enforcement Officer. That Code Enforcement Officer inspects all buildings, enforces zoning ordinance, handles nuisance complaints, abatement procedures, abandoned vehicles, animal complaints, rooming houses, issues citations, and Dean is also a master electrician um, and able to back up the electrical inspector. Uh, we'll take a look at what a nuisance complaint is. The complaint origin comes from you, comes from the community, could come from the police. Um, some come anonymously. We, we just take them by phone, by fax, however you want to send them to us. Um, we go out and inspect. We send orders, allow 24 hours to one week to comply. Non-compliance goes to an abatement procedure with costs assessed to the owner, and we'll touch more on that shortly. Um, this is a good example here of a complaint and some of the things we run into. If you look right at the top here on the roof, that's a deer carcass. And we don't explain how things happen. We just, <laughs> we just go after them. Um, but this is an interesting scenario here because it covers the nuisance complaint with the deer carcass. We have a zoning issue here with the boat being parked in the yard. We have garbage down here, uh, busted up furniture, and also the condition of the garage. So it's, it's rather an interesting complaint. When we go out and take a complaint, it's not necessarily so black and white that it's that, that it's that easy. You have to apply several ordinances, and that's that that is a complexity of that position. This is a home we've been to several times. We've picked up several times, but it continues to happen. And uh, obviously, you can see why it needs to get taken care of. Um, here we're looking at uh, batteries. We look at hazardous materials. We're picking up batteries, tires, furniture. We've picked up air conditioners, refrigerators. Um, here's a home, piles of debris, self-explanatory. Even in the front of the house, off to the right side of the uh, image here, there's more garbage. There's another pile there, and there was also a huge pile behind the garage. And this, uh, this person was warned several times to pick it up, and we finally did it for him. Um, we're going to touch on this, too, when we get to, to our chart here on acceptance. What happened here was a family left this, this rental unit, left everything they owned in the rental unit, the next person comes in, says, hey, I like the place, but I don't like the furniture, so he throws it all out in a big pile out in the backyard. And there it sat. Everybody was happy with it until we went and picked it up. Um, abandoned vehicles, it's getting, we're seeing more and more of those. Um, this is a, an abandoned vehicle. It wasn't even registered to this house, and the tenants there didn't even know who owned it. Um, you'll notice that the windows are busted out of it, all the plastic lights, glass, everything's busted up in this car. The result is it ends up full of garbage. They just threw it out the door, it lands in the car, and there it sat. This car went from here to the crusher. Uh, this is a commercial uh, property. Um, they've got recyclables, cardboard, black bags, white bags. Obviously, they need to get a dumpster or make other means for pickup, but we, we picked this one up as well. The abatement occurs if there's no compliance. After we sent letters, given a reasonable time to do it, it involves the Public Works Department. Uh, they supply the garbage trucks and personnel. The cost assessed to the owner, they get charged for that garbage truck, loader, dump truck, pickup, whatever we need to do those pickups, the full cost of that. They've got it broken down, what it costs to operate those vehicles per hour, all the personnel, time, insurance, everything gets assessed to that homeowner. Um, recently, I, I'd say within the past year and a half to two years, you passed an ordinance that we asked for, um, the cost of that pickup plus 50%. And what that did, it, it added a, a penalty phase to that, to that assessment because some of the owners appreciated the service we provided. And that's, again, absentee owners w called us up and thanked us, you know, for picking up their property because otherwise they would have had to drive two hours to get here, pick it up, find a way to dispose of it. And, of course, they couldn't use the drop-off site. They were from out of town, so they'd have to pay to get rid of it. So it was just easier for them to have us do it. It was a nice service. Um, here's an example um, of a pickup. Um, this is what we start with. We always take before and after photos, and the reason, there's several reasons to do that. It's just to document what's there, because anything that, uh, that is stolen or removed automatically triples in value. This is the other part of the front of this garage. Notice the truck. This is after. Again, we have a before picture, and we'll take after. Um, we'll take a look at housing complaints now. And I put on here complaint or survey. Typically, a uh, uh, survey was done in neighborhoods. We'd take a one block or two block or four block area and survey all the houses. We haven't done that 
Um, because of the things that Pete brought up, not having a housing inspector for so long, we've gotten behind, and now we've de dealt solely with complaints. And complaints has really taken over and pretty much dictates where Dean goes. It's usually the exterior involves the condition of the building. We'll, set, we'll go to inspect, we'll send orders, two, two weeks to 30 days to comply in housing because it usually involves painting or some type of construction, maybe a permit in some cases. Um, extensions are available depending on the complexity and uh, you know we're always cognizant of the finances of, uh, of who's doing it and you know our, our whole um, goal is to, is to gain compliance. Uh, we're, not, we're never out to fine or anything in that order. We want compliance first. Um, this was just a garage. Obviously you can tell there's a hole in the roof. The, the windows are busted out of it. Siding. Um, this garage was removed promptly by the owners. Um, sometimes that's all it takes is just a little prompt you know, just to, to get things done. I mean, they, when they, they called about it immediately and said, yeah, you're right, we're going to take care of it, and they did. This one is still there. Um, obviously, you can tell by the condition, it probably should be raised. There's no repairing this one. It's gone beyond repair. Um, this is some graffiti on a, on a home. Refuse to remove it. It doesn't make a difference uh, whether we send them a letter or not because we don't have an ordinance. We'll talk about that later as well. Um, this home here, if you look at the, uh, the trim paint here, all the eaves, all the windows, and then the siding, of course, is broken up and cracked off it. That looks terrible. I wouldn't want that next door to me. This was a complaint, too. This was just a general complaint that you, you just need to check it out. It wasn't a whole lot of information forthcoming just to check it out. Well, we did check it out. Um, this door here, that doesn't belong here. That belongs up here on the airing porch, and incidentally, there's no railing. There's young children in this home as well. Now this here is a, uh, this is termite damage. These nails right here, we're holding this board. The entire corner of this house started to uh, collapse and you see the vinyl siding on it was going up at an angle. Termites have went absolutely eaten the corner of this house. Here was a home up on the north side that uh, uh, roof members had rotted. Uh, this is actually the porch area of it. And uh, we worked with the homeowner for, for a couple of years, over a couple of summers, to get this done. This house looks fantastic now. It's all been repainted. Everything's been repaired. Masonry work on it's been repaired. It looks wonderful. This house doesn't look wonderful. And it still doesn't. Um, this is on the south side. We've had numerous problems, run-ins with this owner too, and uh, it takes a while to gain compliance. Um, sometimes the, the fines and enforcement acts we take just doesn't get to them, so we're still working on this one. This is a home. Uh, the foundation is uh, pretty much disassembled on it. It's falling down. It's standing on the columns there. We'll see this one again, uh, the end result of what happened with this home. This is a uh, toilet leaking. It's leaking uh, into the basement. Um, the electrical box underneath it, you can see, is rusted up, and you can imagine what type of problems that will uh, that'll end up. There was also raw sewage on the floor, in the basement floor in this house, with tenants, young kids in it. Um, this home here, this was, this is a bathroom. The, com the, the commode would usually be right here, and this tile right here is what they were using to cover the, the, the pipe. Something must have broke with the commode, and they removed it. Here was the water supply to it. Took it out, but they continued to use it. Um, this home has since been condemned. It is vacant and has remained so. Um, this is another apartment. Um, this, was, now, this was a mental commitment here. Um, this individual had some problems, but this is, this is what he left behind. The entire apartment was covered with this. One to two foot deep of books, magazines, food containers, you name it, was in this place. Um, this is another one. Um, engine parts all over the place. This guy was working on transmissions and engines inside the apartment. Now it was cold outside, and we'll show you some more pictures of this. Um, you can see the pistons on the bed, a couple of uh, engine components, transmission. This place was a mess. Oil all over the carpet, and you know now the owner comes in and says, "What am I? What am I going to do about this?" Um, again, the windows are busted out. The guy just kept cranking the heat up. Here's the plumbing held on by duct tape. Notice the bathroom window. It's missing. Tape covering the windows. This one was a uh, parking complaint. That's what it started out. We got, got there, looked at it, and there's this makeshift building in the backyard. And that is a cow. 
Um, this was sitting in the backyard. They were uh, using it, hacking off pieces as they uh, were ready to cook them. And that's just some of the things we come across. Fortunately, this was in the winter. That was all frozen. I will take a look at the zoning ordinance. Um, the part that we enforce is uh, address of storage of vehicles and recreational equipment, materials, commercial vehicles, inoperable vehicles, and paving. Um, for instance, here we have uh, three bolts and a car in a yard. Um, we're not to say you can't do this. It just needs to be done properly, proper setbacks for paving and that, and, or, or a garage, whatever they want to do there. But um, th those, had, those had to be removed, and they were. Um, here's another yard full. Um, no plates on the uh, vehicle on the end here. We consider that inoperable because state law provides it. Uh, you have to have a registration on your vehicle to operate it. Um, and then notice the standing water. And, of course, all the, uh, the lawn is gone from driving over it. There is a garage, incidentally, right here, and they weren't using it. Um, here's another vehicle. Um, technically, it is in the garage. Um, we don't know where the garage went, so obviously the car had to go as well. Um, here's a vehicle here. The, it's, on, it's on asphalt or uh, concrete, but uh, the roof is crushed in. All the windows are busted out of it. And here was a complaint that vehicles in the yard, well, there certainly is, this vehicle's in the yard, but then we have other things. Notice the paint peeling off the building and the debris piled up, junk and debris behind the, behind the house. Um, here's another yard full of vehicles. Um, this one here is becoming more and more apparent to us, uh, more and more complaints about commercial vehicles. Um, Families are using these vehicles to store meat and fresh vegetables in the vehicles. They run an extension cord to the house, or through the trees, on the city right away. But they're parking these big commercial vehicles in residential neighborhoods. And the ordinance for that is that sight lines and the narrower streets in the residential neighborhoods aren't impeded by large commercial vehicles. This street here is very narrow. There's another one in front of the house. There are several of these. We've answered numerous complaints with these commercial vehicles. Uh, we'll touch on raise orders. Um, always a last resort. Um, when it, the issue becomes public safety, it's, uh, we have to get them done. Every time we've done raise orders, it has improved the neighborhood. And we know that because we receive phone calls after we've done it and, and thanking us for finally getting it down. Um, the cost again assessed to the owner. Um, this was the house we had talked about earlier with the foundation missing. Because of numerous freeze and thaw cycles in the foundation um, and being supported on the columns, we noticed that the floor was starting to buckle up in the basement. Um, so we had to get this one down, and this was the end result. This is the front of it. This is the back of it during this. Um, contractors do bid on, on this work. Another example. And another example. Uh, all of these were taken down this year. And then these properties are returned to uh, just to a grass, grass surface. Now we'll take a look at our housing condition. And we had given you some handouts there. Um, this is some of the data that we had got from the assessor's office. Um, homes built prior to 1900, 2,696 dwelling or homes built prior to 1900, 1900 to 1919, 1,861. 1920 to 1939, 2,731, and 1940 to 1949, 1,020 of them. Now this is gonna start showing up on, uh, on the first chart there, the color chart. Um, home styles of note, uh, you've got more on your chart than what we showed here, but we wanted to show a, a comparison here. The ranch style homes, very popular home. Many of them consider a newer type home. They're still building them today. 4,533 of those homes in the city, the average age is 1968. And if you think about that number, many of those homes now are in need of major maintenance, roofs, windows, siding. Old style homes, now that's going to be your Victorians, your big farmhouses and that, 4,555 of them, average age, 1908. Triplexes, 62 of them, average age, 1893. And duplexes, 2,560, average age, 1909. Cape Cod, newer style of home, 1,460 of those, average age, 1949. Now we're going to take a look at our chart here. And how this starts out, what we're trying to show here, is all of them started over here. And then if you picture this graph moving left to right, 
as these houses got older, this is what happens to them. Now, ideally, you'd want them all to stay in the blue, but they don't. We'd like them to stay in the green, but they don't. The older the home gets, of course, maintenance problems become an issue. Um, through some research, we found what they called it the tipping point. And this is an interesting book to read. I got this from the Mead Library. Um, the Tipping Point by Malcolm uh, Gladwell. And he explains what a tipping point is. And what happens with these homes is they reach a certain point and something changes to make them fall below that line, what we call the tipping point here. And whether it was a change of ownership or a change, maybe a single family home went to a duplex, something made that home fall into, fall into some problems. And we're going to explain how that happens as well. But as you can see, as the older homes get, it's just a matter of age. If they're not maintained, this is what's going to happen. And... Dean's job, of course, is to keep all those homes above that tipping point. Part of the problem, again here, hierarchy and effect, owner-occupied single-family homes, least of our problems. Those are all owner-occupied and pride of ownership. Owner-occupied duplex, another good thing because that owner's there. Manager on-site multifamilies, manager off-site multifamilies, a little more problems. If we have somebody there, that, that always helps us. Absentee owner, any home that has an absentee owner, any dwelling unit with an absentee owner, we got problems with, and just incidentally, the absentee owners of duplexes, that's the one we had the most frequent problems with. Now we'll take a look at acceptance here. Um, that chart, and I have that in here as well, we'll show you that. Um, acceptance comes partially from, from the research we've learned here. Demographic shifts is what causes this. Declining property and acceptance by subsequent tenant, and that's what we showed you with that pile of garbage in the yard. There's no intervention. If we haven't had the housing inspector, recovery is near impossible. Once we lose control of these homes, it's very difficult to get them back, and usually then they fall quickly into that, uh, that bottom line with the raise order. What happens is we have a code-compliant home or a nice apartment. Somebody rents it through normal wear and tear. They bring it down to some cosmetic issues, faucet drip. Not a big deal. Maybe a little paint here and there. We normally don't see these homes yet because it's not, it's not that big of a deal. So then somebody comes in, they move out of this normal wear and tear, they want to move back into a nice apartment. So the next person moves in and accepts that normal wear and tear home. He's not too concerned about cosmetic issues or a faucet drip, and he brings it down into the next box where there's more code windows. Maybe he broke a window, now the screens are pushed out, um, broken railing, kids are starting to tear it up, animals are starting to tear it up. And he says, wait a minute, I don't like this. I want to move back up to a normal wear and tear home. Next guy comes in and says, hey, I don't mind. I'll take, that. I'll take the cracked windows and screens missing because the rent's cheap. He takes it, and he brings it down to major violations. Now there's railings missing. we got windows missing, graffiti, storm doors broken, doors off hinges, plumbing problems, electrical problems. Um, this thing's really starting to fall apart. Now we hear about it because somebody's complained and said they don't like this in their neighborhood. So... This is when, uh, when the housing inspector gets involved and tries to bring this thing back up. If we don't get this home under control, now it's going to fall down into borderline habitability because the next person's going to come in and say, hey, that's cheap rent. I'll take it. I don't mind. I'll accept this home the way it is. Now we've got entry doors missing and broken. They're heating the home with stove and kerosene heaters. Pets defecating in the unit, and we've seen this. Unit's in complete disarray. New tenant every couple of months. We call them professional tenants. They know how to move in, pay a couple hundred bucks, and stay there because they know how long the eviction process is. These are the ones we had the major problem with because there's such a turnover in them that we just don't catch up to them. Um, what happens there, to follow the complaint versus prevention. The complaint inspection, when somebody calls us, is always after the fact. So the things that uh, we just talked about have already happened. The key to neighborhood preservation is, again, neighborhood surveys. We need that inspector going out and surveying those neighborhoods, preventing anything to happen. Prevention, that's the whole key to, uh, to having these neighborhoods survive. Um, numerous studies have been done, and this is probably one of the, the, the most popular one. March of 1982 in the Atlantic Monthly, there was an article written called Broken Windows, and it was about police and neighborhood survey, or neighborhood uh, safety. And this thing was just, was tore up by a lot of other media. Um, several of them, Don't Live With Broken Windows. Um, National League of Cities wrote Divided We Fall. Um, Greensboro Housing 
Coalition, and they all mentioned this article. Um, this was done in California. Does broken windows law enforcement reduce serious crime? Um, the housing situation of low-income families in Milwaukee. All of these studies have gone on to say to, or deny what was said in that article, but the one thing that does remain is that the neighborhood success or failure is dependent on intervention by concerned entities, the residents, police, and code enforcement, and that's all of us, code enforcement, but primarily it rests with the residents. We have to get them on our side first, and that's part of Dean's job as well. Um, another book uh, that I did get from the library here, uh, Fixing Broken Windows, and this explains a lot of the things that they talked about originally and goes through the, the procedures for taking care of some of those problems. I'll just go through quick here some of the stuff that's in that book um, where he says disorder demoralizes communities, undermines commerce, leads to the abandonment of public spaces, and undermines public confidence in the ability of the government to solve problems. Um, what happens there is that people that can leave that neighborhood do, and that's people moving to outlying suburbs and that because they want out of there, and they leave the people that are there to take care of this problem. Well, what happens when they vacate that property? Who moves in? somebody that accepts it and says, I don't mind, so we've lost that neighborhood. When they asked us to do this presentation, they asked what we need. And uh, after conferring with, with Pete and Paulette and our lead inspector, Larry, we'd, uh, we determined that the one thing that we do need is to bring our department in line with all the other departments in the country practically and that was to change our TO to code enforcement officer because this person is going to be writing citations and issuing orders to remove vehicles and whatnot and code enforcement officer just sounds good when you put a code enforcement officer in somebody issuing a citation we're going to get we're going to have a little more authority um, and particularly maintain that full-time code enforcement officer um, Having that uh, housing inspector gone from November of 2002 to June of this year, we really got behind. Um, I think we totaled up, was it 1,200 inspections that I did in the time that he was gone, in addition to trying to keep up with the other stuff. Um, so we, need, uh, we can't let that happen again. Um, additionally, a full or part-time nuisance complaint officer would be ideal. Um, just to take care of the garbage complaints because the housing inspector is busy doing the critical neighborhood preservation. It would be nice to have someone just take care of the garbage. Um, a municipal court, that's in the works, and we thank you for that. Um, that's going to work out well for us. Because we have citation authority, we've always had it, now we're going to start using it. An ordinance to abate graffiti, I think you have that one as well. Did you pass that one out? Did you get the examples of that? Um, that was just some that I pulled off from other uh, cities, other communities. And it, it's actually just a matter of making the graffiti a nuisance, declaring it a nuisance, and then we can go ahead and get rid of it. Um, that house we looked at earlier that uh, had the graffiti on it, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, businesses normally take care of it themselves, um, but if we have someone that just refuses to do it, it looks terrible, and uh, we, need to be able to, we need to have the authority to go on that property and abate that nuisance. Um, the next one's been talked about repeatedly over the past several years, and that was a replenishable contingency fund to expedite enforcement actions. Um, anytime we have uh, to do a raise order, even on some of the small garages in that, um, it takes us months, sometimes years, to get those done because of what we have to go through to make sure that we have all the documentation necessary, then we have to get bids on it, and go to the court several times to get these things done. If we were able to get them done sooner, it would eventually come full circle and nobody would allow that to happen. If we started taking garages down after a 30-day notice or taking abandoned homes down that are in bad enough condition in 30 days, it, would, it wouldn't continue to happen. People would realize that we mean business and we're coming to get it unless they take care of it. Um, a clarification of the abandoned vehicle ordinance. Um, Sergeant Tarkowski and myself have met with uh, Chuck Adams on this ordinance. What happens is the police department's ordinance is a little different from how we enforce it. We enforce it through a zoning issue. So what happens is the police come up and they tag a vehicle, tell them to get it off the street. Well, where does he put it? He puts it in his backyard. <laughs> so then we go in and we tell him to get out of his backyard and where, of course, where does he put it? 
back on the street. So we need, uh, need to clarify that, how we're going to handle those abandoned vehicles and just make it a universal ordinance that they can't be there. They can be in the garage, what, what have you, but they can't be on the street or in the yard. This is just the listing here. We, of course, we thank you for your attention. Um, this is just the listing of our personnel. Larry Hobelink is our plumbing inspector and lead inspector. Jack Vanderweel, Northside building inspector. Pat Eirich, Southside. Mark Summer is our electrical inspector. Dan Benversi is our clearwater inspector. Now you've just met Dean Hesslink, code enforcement officer. Myself and Tracy Herman is our permit clerk. We'll take some questions. Uh, future questions can be answered by calling inspection department 459-3477. You can give Dean a call at 459-3491. You can call me 459-3490. And ride-alongs are encouraged. Um, we recently went out, and that's what prompted a lot of this, uh, with Mr. Berg and Bonnie Serta and Anthony Bonet here. And uh, I hope we enlightened them. Um, it was entertaining, some of the things we saw. Um, but they're out there, and we want to make sure that uh, you're aware of it. And we welcome any of you to come, come and ride along with Dean or myself or anybody in the department and see what we do. Any questions? For me or Dean or Pete? Some of the concerns that I get generally from the residents in my district is the individual a homeowner who owns the home and after receiving citation after citation and they, they have no desire to sell the home and they're never going to pay those fines. Is there anything we can do to help your department to be more effective in those areas? That's the worst case scenario, I know. I kind of knew you were going to ask that yeah, too because yeah. <laughs> we've talked about it. Yeah. Um, that's a difficult one because we've, we've gone that route. We're hoping the municipal court will help with that. Um, what we can do now is we send those, we package that all up, and we send it over to the attorney's office, and it gets into the court system and, and kind of sits for a little while. When we can go out and issue them a citation, they have to answer to it. So we're hoping, hoping that that's going to boost them a little bit to get, because they're going to have to come down. And, and go to the court, and then they can either ask to have it go to the circuit court or whatever, but it's still going to require action on their part. So hopefully that, that'll help. The citation in the municipal court will help with that. Yes. Um, I know we've had some conversation about uh, possibly adopting an ordinance that's much more strict and helpful in getting buildings that need to be taken care of, either taken care of or raised. What's the process with that right now? Um, I, I think, did we distribute that to all? Did, did everybody get one of those on that ordinance for uh, abandoned buildings? and raise orders. There were some issues that, that had to be ironed out with that, with the, the way our ordinance was written and what class city it was. Um, so we haven't got those resolved yet, but that would, that would certainly help if, the, if that ordinance was tighter. It, it may not be so much an ordinance issue as it is a program issue, the way we handle it. So we're looking into that as well, because we, that's, again, working with, that, with, the, with the replenishable fund would get that done a lot quicker. Matt, are you su suggesting that the receivership program could possibly be implemented in the city of Sheboygan, even with its classification? Or um, that for those of they, they might not be aware of what the receivership is, you might want to explain what right. that is. We've talked to other communities about how they take care of problems like that, and one of the ones that uh, that Bonnie just brought up was that was the receivership. What they did was, if the home was was deemed to be abandoned, if there was some method of us deeming a home abandoned we can ask the court to appoint a receiver, a receivership for that home, i.e. a contractor or a property management company, whatever, and the requirement would be that once they took this receivership, they had to maintain the property, bring it back into code compliance. And at some point down the road, of course, there would be some financial issue with the owner to pay that money back or whatever, but um, there were some communities that had used that. Um, they had uh, worked with their, uh, with their circuit court on getting that done, and. It, it seemed to be effective. I, I, it seemed to work. Any other questions? Wonderful. Once again, Dean. <laughs> Dean Hesselink is a housing inspector. Um, he's done a great job for us. Jumped right in. <laughs> Cold feet, jumped in, but he's doing well. And, uh, and uh, the community has embraced him, I think. <laughs> so, and again, thank you. Thank you, Matt, Dean, Mr. Fullerton. That, that 
uh, takes care of our program for this evening. So now I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the committee hall meeting. Motion made to second to adjourn the committee to hall meeting. All in favor? Aye. Contrary? We're adjourned. Bonet, Soda, Graf, Manny, Montemayor, Perez, Peterson, Rinfleisch, Sagali, Stefan, Van Akron, Vanderweel, Wangaman, and Warner. 14 present. Quorum is present. Alderman Warner. I thank your honor. I move the minutes of the last common council meeting be approved and that the same stand is entered on the record. Second. Moved to second at the minutes of the previous council meeting stand approved. Under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Bonet, Soda, Graf, Manny, Montemayor, Perez, Peterson, 